thanks to, uh, to Peter and his family for, for uh, their kind hospitality. It's fun to be in London and have a chance to talk about this work. And it's fun to hear Lizzie talk. And, and, uh, and it's important to, I think, take advantage of the ability now to make and to really understand these mouse models. They're really teaching us a lot about this disorder. So I'm really representing a bunch of folks, uh, folks from my own lab, Pavel Belichinko and Jean-Dominique Delcroix, Ahmad Salehi, Kazan, Ching Biao Wu, not listed, from Craig Garner's lab uh, at Stanford, from Rob Malinka's lab at Stanford, in particular, Ale Alexander Kleshevnikov, other colleagues at Stanford, and also uh, colleagues at UCSF and UCSD and UC Berkeley. So it's the center that I'm representing, and you know already that the problem is, in fact, an extra copy of one chromosome uh, <clears throat> with all its normal genes. And so the real <coughs> issue here is everything that we see in Down syndrome has in some way to be due directly or indirectly to the presence of an extra chromosome. And sorting that out, as Lizzie indicated, is not simple. So I'm going to define the problem first as the disruption of cognitive circuits due to abnormalities and synapses. And rather than go on, I'm going to just talk about this. Uh, genes tell cells important pieces of information for their well-being. That's a simple idea, but it's exactly right. Here's another simple idea, and that's that neuronal circuits mediate all brain functions. Everything that you see, that you hear, that you feel, that you interpret, every action you make, every reaction is based upon the operation of brain circuits. And it's a very helpful thing to just think about that, because that means that every dysfunction is due to the dysfunction of one or more brain circuits. And so what's a circuit? A circuit is really a series of elements, cellular elements, in this case neurons. We bring in information from some source. The circuit processes that information, and there's a change in function at the other end of that uh, list. The circuit is made up of individual neurons, and I'll just remind you they have a cell body with a nucleus. They have a dendrite, which is a kind of antenna, and they have an axon, which is a kind of wire that allows the electrical signal generated here to pass through the cell body and to communicate itself to the next neuron in the circuit at the synapse. Now, I know you know this, but I'll just remind you of this. The synapse is the point of information transfer between neurons in a circuit. And it has several parts. Well, it has two very important parts. There's a presynaptic terminal, and there's a postsynaptic uh, nerve cell. And if we blow this up, Right here, here's the presynaptic terminal. Here's the postsynaptic cell. It could be a cell body. It could be a dendrite. And here's this little space called the synapse. And then if we blow this up again in cartoon fashion, here's the presynaptic terminal right here. Here are mitochondria producing ATP locally. And here are synaptic vesicles, which are fusing with the surface membrane, uh, releasing their neurotransmitter contents, which are then diffusing across this gap to activate their specific postsynaptic receptors to create then this <coughs> electrical discharge in the postsynaptic cell, which is then transmitted on. Now, I give you this information because our idea is that Down syndrome is fundamentally a disorder of disrupted synaptic function, that something happens uh, at the synapse to disrupt information transfer, to block the processing of signals, and to make it impossible to normally respond and selected aspects of function and behavior and cognition in particular. So we'll talk a little bit about the problem, then we'll examine synapse structure and function in uh, mouse models of Down syndrome. I want to review the role that neurotrophic factors have in maintaining synapses and then show that increased expression of one gene disrupts neurotrophic factor transport and signaling and leads or contributes significantly and conspicuously the degeneration of cholinergic neurons. So first of all, the neurology of Down syndrome, we've talked about it already. It's a disorder in which manifestations can be disabling, in which cognitive problems are very significant, extend across the lifespan during development, during adolescence, and later life. And we've talked already about people with Down syndrome showing the neuropathology of Alzheimer's disease by age 40 and many in later life go on to show cognitive decline. The exact percentage of those individuals is not certain, but it's a known and common problem 
in older people with Down syndrome that they have cognitive issues that arise. So how do you study the idea that synapses are disrupted? Well, first of all, you take that as an important thing because you, in fact, know from the human literature or the literature on human samples that synapses are abnormal. Uh, I wanted to go back here. You see this little thing here, this little kind of excrescence. That's called a spine. It's called a dendritic spine. And we know that these are points of information transfer. It's very typical that, in fact, synapses are made upon spines. And what we know about Down syndrome is that if you compare the dendrites and the spines of people with Down syndrome, young children with Down syndrome, to normal, that there are differences. And the differences can be either that these spines are very long and hairy, that they're very short and too numerous, or in the last panel, that they're relatively fewer in number and those that are present are quite enlarged. So at least three different spine phenotypes, if you will, in Down syndrome tissue versus the normal work from Marin Padilla many years ago. So our hypothesis is simply the following, that an extra gene, or perhaps genes, and in fact I'll suggest to you that it's more than one gene, ultimately creates abnormal synapses, and that that is the underlying substrate for the cognitive problems that are experienced by people with Down syndrome throughout the lifespan. Probably very many circuits suffer, and very many different kinds of synapses are involved. But we'll, uh, we'll stay with this hypothesis, which, which is rather simple, and we'll try to take these apart uh, one by one. So what are our goals in the center? So we want very much to define changes in synaptic structure and function in cognitive circuits in mouse models, determine which gene is responsible to examine the mechanisms responsible, and using these insights to accelerate development of effective treatments for people with Down syndrome. This is the most important goal we have in mind, but we know we know that we won't achieve this goal unless we know more about what genes and what mechanisms are engaged. So the strategy then is to say, what is the abnormality of interest that we want to find and, and examine? What is it? In this case, it's cognitive abnormalities, and we focus on the synapse. Then we need to build a model to, to recreate the abnormality. And so Lizzie talked about mouse models, her mouse model. Here's, here's a model system now in which to recreate or at least to examine the abnormality. We then have to find and characterize the abnormality, define the gene, define the mechanism, and again, pursue treatments that either reduce the expression of the gene to normal or alternatively block the mechanism. So let's begin then uh, at looking at synaptic structure. And again, the idea is to focus on uh, synapses that are abnormal. And here's the TS65 DN mouse that Lizzie mentioned to you. This is the mouse that has a relatively large piece of DNA present in excess from mouse 16, and it shares an extra copy of many of the genes that are responsible for Down syndrome. There's about 140 genes in the segment that extends from GAB-PA to MX1. So here's our mouse. And actually, this isn't real. It's a very cute mouse, by the way. It's not really our mouse. The mouse is brown. But I, I just like this mouse so much that I end up <laughs> I really actually, you know, I have a lot in common with this mouse, including large ears. Anyway. Okay, so what do we study? We don't study the whole brain. We study hippocampus. And we study the hippocampus because it's terribly important for learning and memory, and it is known on the basis of structural studies and cognitive tests to be uh, especially affected in Down syndrome. So hippocampal function is clearly abnormal out of proportion to other brain functions in people with Down syndrome. And that's evident both structurally and functionally. And so here's a circuit, if you will, uh, an axon coming in from entorhinal cortex. And here's the dentate granule cell. This is, if you will, neuron 1 in the circuit. This is neuron 2, CA3. And here's neuron 3. So again, here are the dendrites of dentate granule cells. Here are the axon. The dendrites of CA3 cells. Here are the axon. The dendrites of CA1 cells. Here are the cell body. Here are the axon going back to cortex very important circuit for learning and memory. And let's take apart in particular this area right here, the dentate granule uh, cell layer. So here are a number of these dentate granule cells, and I've pulled one out specifically to highlight it here and to tell you then about the structural studies that we engaged in. What we can do in individual dentate granule cells is to fill their cell bodies with something called lucifer yellow. And as a result of that, we can completely fill the dendritic tree of these cells. Now, let me make a quick point here. 
Note that dentate granule cells receive several different kinds of inputs. They receive excitatory inputs, designated here in green, inhibitory inputs, designated here in red, and modulatory inputs, designated in blue. Well, let's see what these cells look like when you inject them. And what you see, and this is this line of cells right here, is you can beautifully fill the dendritic trees. And, and Pavel Belichinko can do probably 50 cells a day injected this way, individual neurons injected quite on purpose. Here are the CA1 neurons. Look how beautiful they are. And then here are the dentate granule cells. Here's the dentate gyrus right here. And here he's been able to inject a number of such cells. Now, once you do this, you can then blow it up to higher power, and you can begin to examine the spines. Remember the little places where synapses are made. And so if you look at normal mice, the litter mate controls, you see at all ages, beautiful long shafts of dendrites. And these, these are the dendrites of dentate granule cells, and they have beautiful little spines uh, poking along the edge in quite nice fashion. And this looks very much the same at 16 months, even in very old mice. The TS65 DN mouse looks quite different, and the differences are several fold. But notice that in every case, there seem to be fewer spines than normal, and they're very, very large. Some of these spines have volumes that are probably 50 times the normal, so quite abnormal in the view that the spines are quite enlarged. And not only are spines enlarged, but the presynaptic terminals are enlarged uh, in, in the same way, to the same extent. So now we have evidence that both the pre- and the postsynaptic elements are quite abnormal. And by the way, this is dentate gyrus, but in terms of the enlargement of spines, this is true for the whole brain. It's all true in all areas of cortex. The presynaptic terminals and the postsynaptic spines are, are far too large. So the summary here, then, is that whether one is looking at inhibitory inputs or excitatory inputs, there's an enlargement of the presynaptic terminals, and there's enlargement of spines. And I won't go into the detailed data on this, but that's just very characteristic. In one region only, the dentate gyrus, fewer spines also, but generally enlargement of spines and presynaptic croutons. So there's several possible explanations for this, but the one that makes the most sense is this one that suppression of normal excitatory input leads to increased size of synapses. Now, this is something that is a logical conclusion from studies in vitro and from other model systems. It suggests that these spines are getting bigger, the synapses are getting bigger, because they're inefficient, and in particular, they're inefficient at conveying excitatory information. It's as if you're cupping your hand to your ear to hear a little bit better. That's the probable it's possible and certainly a probable interpretation. There's an interesting piece of the story that kind of supports this. If you look at all of the inputs, so what you can do is you can fill now the cells with lucifer yellow and you can immunostain for the various neurotransmitter systems that impinge upon individual spines. And I won't show you the pictures, although I'd be happy to later. But then you can say, what goes where? Which kind of neurotransmitter system innervates spines and spine necks and the shafts of dendrites. And if you look at sort of total spine input, there really isn't any difference between the innervation of spine heads, spine necks, and dendrite shafts. There's no real difference between TS65 and 2N mice. But if you look in particular at inhibitory inputs, what you see is a large increase, actually, at the necks of spines, a quite significant increase at the nix of spines. And the net effect of inhibiting current flow right here by inhibitory inputs would be to basically isolate the spine from the shaft. And this could be predicted to enhance inhibition, to basically make it very difficult to transfer excitatory information from here to here. So suspicious and interesting morphological signature that might actually agree with that possible interpretation we raised. So now what we're doing, and we, we've got a long ways to go, is to try to understand what's the genetic basis for this and, and what's the mechanism for these enlarged spines, enlarged synapses. And there's a strategy that we use, which is now one of those typical strategies, although it's not so simple, it's typical. And that is to essentially whittle away that piece of DNA that's extra, 
So we begin with mice, the TS65DN mouse, which has all of the abnormalities that we care about, and we try to produce mice that are smaller segmental trisomies. We may need several generations to do this, we just don't know, but we try to whittle away that extra chromosome. And finally, go to the point of trying to identify an individual gene, which when taken away, prevents the phenotype, and which when put back in, recreates the phenotype. So all, all this said, the second generation mouse, the one we have looked at most carefully so far, is the TS1 mouse made by Charlie Epstein. This mouse from Muriel Davis and this mouse from Charlie Epstein, which as you see is a shorter uh, segment. It's, uh, it's shorter by about 40 genes. It begins with SOD1, which is actually inactivated and goes to MX1. So what about these guys? Well, just a uh, long story short, they have the abnormality uh, that we found in the TS65DN mouse, but it seems to be less severe. So here's spine density. Here's the decrease in TS65. It's still decreased in TS1, but not quite as severely. The spine heads are markedly enlarged in TS65. They're also enlarged in TS1s, and it's significant. And the length of the spine next tends to be shorter in TS65s, also shorter in TS1s, but not quite as severe. You can also see the difference at the level of the pattern of innervation. So here there was a fairly marked difference, 26% to 9%. Here, this is not much different, so you're getting nice replica replicability across different control groups. But here's this difference it appears to be less. So in every way, it appears that the TS1 mouse, yes, is abnormal, but not quite as abnormal, suggesting then a genetic interaction that is responsible for this that may be difficult to elucidate, but certainly we're on the track. There must be genes in TS1 that drive this change or are sufficient for this change, are necessary for the change, but there must be genes in the top part that we've eliminated that somehow interact and make it worse. So, so synaptic structure is abnormal in these guys, and we've got a long ways to go to understand what more to do about this. Again. These genes are perfectly capable in and of themselves of creating these phenotypes, but they appear to interact with genes up here to make them fully severe. Now let me take the cell out again and say that the important thing to do next is to understand how these cells work, not just what they look like, but how they work. Lizzie mentioned that, uh, that her mouse has an abnormality in hippocampal behavioral function, and that's true in this mouse as well. Uh, the, the mouse does differ from normal in its ability to remember where things are in space. So this is a hippocampal function that's clearly not normal in this mouse. And so it would be very interesting to look at tasks and to really look at physiologically at these neurons, which are so important for those behaviors. So again, the dentate granule cells. And so what we do here, and again, this is Rob Malenka and Alexander Kleshevnikov has done most of the work. One can stimulate that first axon, if you will, and record from the area around the cells that we've been looking at, the whose morphology we've been looking at, the dentate granule cells. So what does one see? Liz has brought this up. In fact, what you can do is you can stimulate these guys at low frequency, and there's absolutely no difference. They behave perfectly normally. Stimulating here and recording here at low frequency shows no changes. The neurons behave quite normally. There's a and in fact, those curves are shown here in the sort of black. The CON is controlled. These are at low frequency. They don't differ significantly. There's a particular physiological test that includes stimulating at high frequency. And when one does that, one creates an increase in the strength of synapses. They become better, more efficient. And that is a cellular model for learning that physiologists typically use. It's called long-term potentiation or synaptic plasticity. Point is, if you stimulate at high frequency in a normal mouse, you see this little curve shifts over. There's an increase in the slope of that curve, and that's mapped here as, if you will, uh, the magnitude of this change. But in particular, it's a slope change versus time. So here, you're stimulating at low frequency. Here, you stimulate at high frequency. The normal guys hop right up there, and now their synapses are 25% more efficient. The slope has increased. No change in slope in the TS65DN. Point is, these guys are not becoming more efficient with high-frequency stimulation. 
They're not behaving in a normal way cellularly. It's as if they can't learn these dentate granule cell neurons. So synaptic plasticity is suppressed. We wanted to know what that was about. And I won't go into detail about this. But what we could say is there was decreased current flow through those receptors that are known to be terribly important for learning and memory called the NMDA receptor. So NMDA receptors are not normal. Their current flow is less. And you can see that comparing the black bar to the white bar at the first and second and third stimulus. They're not normal. So one thought is perhaps they're not normal because the receptors themselves are too few in number. They have the wrong subunit composition. They're sitting in the wrong place. Uh, and, and that was possible. But we thought that wasn't true because if one pops the magnesium out of these guys, which is normally sitting there when they're not depolarized, one sees absolutely normal current flow. And in fact, if one depolarizes the cell or takes away the magnesium altogether, current flow is normal. So it looked like the number of these receptors and their functional properties were normal. But they just weren't conducting current normally. And the suggestion was that they weren't properly depolarized. And the further suggestion was they weren't properly depolarized because there was excessive inhibition, too much inhibitory tone in the hippocampus. And in fact, if you use a drug called picrotoxin, you can see that after adding picotoxin, now current flow through the NMDA receptor is entirely normal. And in fact, LTP is restored completely. In fact, it's a little stronger in the TS65 mouse than it is in the normal mouse. So here's, I think, a very important, and I would argue hopeful, discovery that there is excessive inhibition of neural circuits in the Down syndrome mouse model. That there's excessive inhibition, there's an imbalance and the imbalance has inhibition taking a larger role than normal, and that's a big problem. Well, it's a big problem for the mouse, anyway. So, again, synaptic plasticity abnormal and restored with picrotoxin. And that's extremely exciting because it says that if we worked on inhibitory mechanisms, perhaps we could restore learning and memory, at least in the model system. Now, you could say, how are you going to do that? And the reality is, one needs to think of a variety of strategies about restoring normal levels of inhibition to excitation. The first question is, so where does the inhibition come from? Where does this excess arise from? And one possibility is, the, is that it arises presynaptically with excessive release of GABA, the neurotransmitter that's in the inhibitory neurotransmitter, GABA. And what we can tell you is that at least in slices, it looks like, in fact, that might be true because the frequency, but not the amplitude, of these miniature inhibitory potentials is increased. So that's one possibility. So here's a proposed mechanism for you, and there's much more to learn, but here's what we think. There's increased inhibition, and that may be pre- and post-synaptic, but certainly post-synaptic factors. Because the inhibition is too strong, the cells are being clamped down. They're not being allowed to be depolarized normally. And so decreased depolarization happens. Because of that, there's decreased current flow through NMDA receptors. Because of that, synaptic plasticity isn't normal. And because of that, learning is suppressed. And again, it's very exciting if that's true. Because what that would mean in our scheme is that we've begun to define an important mechanistic consideration here. And again, once we know the mechanism, we can think about treatments. And in this case, treatments that would block the mechanism would be treatments that would subtly turn down inhibition. Now, we can't give picrotoxin to people, and there's a concern in Down syndrome that inhibiting inhibition, turning down inhibition, could cause seizures. But if one could find out which elements were abnormal and act on those elements at a mechanistic level, or find some combination of drugs that subtly reduced inhibition, Perhaps one could, in the near term even, have treatments that would enhance learning in Down syndrome. Now, we don't know the genes yet. I'll just indicate very briefly that whatever those genes are, they're still present in the TS1 mouse because just as was seen in TS65, there's essentially no synaptic plasticity in the TS1 mouse. And again, as was for the TS65 DN mouse, one can completely obliterate that by uh, putting in picrotoxin. So there's excessive inhibition in both the TS1 and the TS65 DN mouse, and now we have to think 
about how to go forward, it's useful to continue to define the genes, and we'll do that. We need to do that. But I'll have to be lucky to find the gene uh, or the genes because, in fact, it may be plural genes. They may be different parts of the chromosome, and it may take us some years to do that. Having said that, I'm very excited about the mechanism because I know now exactly what to look at. I can, we can define in detail the inhibitory system in hippocampus, and we can even begin to try drugs in mice that might actually turn down inhibition. In fact, Craig Garner's lab is doing that right now, and I won't say more than to say the initial returns are very encouraging that may well be drugs that turn down inhibition and enhance behavior in the TS65DN mouse. I, still, I think it's still too preliminary to make that conclusion, but we're encouraged from the early returns that the drugs we're delivering are making a difference on behavior in those mice. Okay, now there's a separate pathway that I'll spend the rest of my time on, and it's this modulatory pathway, a pathway that has cholinergic neurons feeding up into the hippocampus and, and, and changing the level, the set point at which these neurons respond to excitatory inputs. Cholinergic inputs are really important. Essentially, cholinergic inputs tell these cells, pay attention, something important is going to happen. They, they increase their probability of firing in response to other excitatory inputs. And I've talked about synapses and that neuron circuits mediate all brain functions, but there's a kind of flow of information that I haven't talked about. So we've talked about a flow of information that goes this way, but there's another very important flow of information that goes the other way. So circuits are maintained, are kept alive, are kept intact by the exchange of trophic information from uh, postsynaptic cells to presynaptic cells. And one very important mechanism for doing that is the release of neurotrophic factors, small protein molecules, that are released from dendrites and are made available to receptors on the presynaptic terminals, the axons. And so neurotrophic factors uh, are a logical place to look at, a logical process to inquire about in the setting where synapses are becoming dysfunctional. Now, we know from other work in our lab, and there are several other labs around the world that work on this, Roz Siegel at Harvard, Dave Ginty at Hopkins, this is probably the way that most of this information moves. It, it's, it's the case that neurons have very long axons. I, it's, people are surprised here. In neurons with long axons, the axon can be a thousand times in length the diameter of the cell body and can be 99.9% .9 of the cell. So axons are a big deal. When it comes to neurons, this is most of the cell. And so it's always been unclear how in the world a signal that's generated here could be moved effectively here, because here and the nucleus in the cytosol is where many of the most important messages are registered. Here are, by the, for the, here are where all the genes are. So you've got to talk to the genome to really keep this circuit alive. How do you do it? And the idea here now is that trophic factors bind to specific receptors, and they cluster about them signaling proteins. And that, that whole complex is then internalized into something that we've called the signaling endosome. That's then loaded on motors and carried retrogradely using dynein uh, back to the cell body where it signals. So the so-called signaling endosome, we think, carries the signal, and if not all of it, most of it. So our hypothesis was that maybe that was disrupted, at least in some neurons, those cholinergic neurons, in Down syndrome, and we thought that for a variety of reasons. One reason is that in, Down, in Alzheimer's disease, there appears to be a problem with NGF nerve growth factor, one of these trophic factors, the traffic of that. A second is that the neurons that are cholinergic neurons in the brains of people with Down syndrome and Alzheimer's disease both show atrophy, and they are apparently lost. And that's exactly what you would see if you in interrupted the trophic support for these cells, if you interrupted transport of that signal and signaling endosomes. So the question is, is there any role for failed trophic factor support in Down syndrome? And again, the neurons being looked at are the cholinergic neurons from the basal forebrain that send their axons to hippocampus. It's in hippocampus where they receive their trophic factor nerve growth factor, or NGF. This is the principal source by which they receive NGF. NGF here is terribly important during development for maintaining survival of neurons and in mature animals for keeping them robust and big and strong. 
So it's produced in the hippocampus, regulates differentiation and survival and maintenance, and these neurons degenerate in both Alzheimer's disease and in Down syndrome. So the question we had is, uh, does NGF play a role? And so we went back to the TS65 DN mouse and asked the question, what do those neurons look like in this mouse? And the answer in this mouse is they don't look very good. So here we're looking at old mice, <coughs> comparing the normal litter mates here with the TS65 DN uh, animals here, and there are fewer brown spots, and the brown spots are smaller. These are cholinergic neurons stained here with an antibody to P75. So atrophy and apparent loss of neurons in the TS65 DN basal forebrain. Just what would happen if you interrupted their supply of NGF? So the question was, is there really any problem with NGF signaling? Well, there was no problem with NGF production in hippocampus. It was normal, entirely normal at the level of the mRNA. And in fact, NGF protein levels were double normal in hippocampus in these mice. There was no problem in studies of receptor binding and internalization for NGF, perfectly normal. And we know from other studies that NGF acts quite robustly on these guys. I'll tell you about that in just a second. But the bottom line was we saw no abnormalities except for a defect in NGF transport. And that was extreme. And I'll just show you how uh, uh, we'll do those experiments. So uh, the generation of these neurons was correlated with failure of retrograde movement of NGF, uh, almost certainly in signaling endosomes. And I'll show you how we do the experiment. What we do is we take radio-labeled NGF and we stick it in hippocampus. And then we watch it move back to the basal forebrain to these cholinergic neuron cell bodies. And we can measure that quite accurately. And if this is the amount of NGF transported in a normal mouse, this is the amount transported in its litter mate control, uh, its litter mate uh, Down syndrome model mouse. Markedly decreased. Markedly decreased. And then the question becomes, why is that? How does that arise? Well, we know it must occur inside the axon because it's bound and internalized normally. So what in the world explains this? And because it's a genetic model, we pursued a genetic strategy, and we first looked again at the TS1 mouse, the TS1CGA mouse, so this little guy. And we asked the question, what do these neurons look like in this, this mouse? And so here's the answer. If this is now NGF transport, if this is NGF transport in the normal mouse, this is NGF transport in the TS65DN mouse, this is what happens in TS1. It goes from about 10% of normal to 73% of normal by taking those 40 genes out. And if we talk about cell number, it goes from decreased in the TS65DN mouse to not different from normal in the TS1 mouse. And if we talk about cell size and we measure cell profile area, we go from shrunken and not normal in the uh, TS65 uh, mouse to a size that's in, it's in significantly different from normal in the TS1 mouse. So we've really restored, or prevented, if you will, this defect to a large extent by getting rid of those 40 genes. So these are uh, several of the interesting genes that are sitting in the segment that differentiates TS1 from TS65. And quite frankly, if you had have asked me four or five years ago, I would have said, I can't possibly tell you which genes involved. I mean, maybe they're all involved. And so then you have to begin to take guesses. And so we thought, well, SOD1 was a very interesting gene because it causes this uh, potentially free radical uh, injury, or at least conceivably so. And there was a lot of interest in SOD1. And we, we did an experiment where we bred a female with TS65 with a male that was heterozygously deleted for SOD1. In other words, it was missing one copy of SOD1. And in preliminary studies, we saw nothing different. The transport was still abnormal. Another gene in the segment is the gene for the amyloid precursor protein, about which you've already heard some little bit today. And that was interesting because we knew if you overexpressed APP in flies and in mice, the axons just didn't look quite normal. And so we thought we'd do the same experiment with APP, and we did that experiment. Again, we bred a male that had lost one of its APP copies with the female TS65DN. And what you get from that are normal mice normal mice that have only one copy of APP, TS65s that have three copies of APP, and TS65s that have two copies of APP. So we're really asking the question, does there, is there any difference made by getting rid of one copy of one gene? So here's the data. 
So here's NGF transport in the normal. Here's the NGF transport in the TS-65. And here's the TS-65 with only two copies of APP. So three copies of APP, two copies of APP. From about 5% of normal here to more than 50, about 53% of normal, a big change. And here again, cell profile areas. Here are the TS-65s with three copies. Here TS-65 with two copies of APP. Removing one copy of one gene makes a conspicuous contribution to transport and basal forebrain cholinergic neuron size. And that's the first example that I've ever seen of this. And it's an example that really encourages hope because that suggests that if we go after this gene's expression, one might materially influence support for these neurons and for their, for their normal function. So APP is really interesting, but I've told you that to really secure the deal, one has to put APP back in, just APP, and, so, and, and ask about transport and other features. And so we've done that. And whether we've looked at Bruce Lamb's TG a transgenic wild-type APP mouse that overexpresses NGF, or at mice that make mutant APP, the mutant that causes Alzheimer's disease in some families, we see a decrease in transport of NGF that's modest but significant, and perhaps even a little more than modest. And with a double mutation, using the mouse that expresses a mutant APP and a mutant PS1, both of these transgenes uh, modeled after their human counterparts that cause familial Alzheimer's disease, we see an even larger decrease in NGF transport. Interestingly, these decreases are not as severe as the Downs mouse, and there's no evident degeneration of basal forebrain neurons in these mice. We think it's because there's still substantial transport, but it makes the point, this mouse especially makes the point, that it isn't just APP in the Downs mouse, it's APP interacting with other genes that produces the severe deficit. So it's not true that many genes are not involved. Probably they are. But it turns out that some make critical contributions. And that's hopeful because one can focus on those to direct one's uh, uh, look for therapeutic agents. So just to summarize, an extra copy of one gene plays a conspicuous role uh, in these two important phenotypes in the setting of the trisomic geno genome. So, we know now that we get deficits in transport and that we think that that may well contribute to abnormal neuronal function. But what is it really about APP? We know it's overexpression of APP now, but what is it about that? And we can say that we don't know. A beta is this peptide produced from APP. Uh, it's not required because there, these levels are not increased. You know that A beta is increased in Alzheimer's disease brain in a large, to a great extent, but there's no increase in A beta in these mice. Here's the processing pathway for APP. Here's the full length protein, the amino terminus outside the cell, the C terminus inside. Here's the A beta peptide. You can cut it in a couple of ways. In this direction, using a, 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 an enzyme called alpha secretase, you release a fragment, you have a fragment remaining called C83. You have a that gets acted upon by an enzyme called gamma secretase, releasing this little stump and releasing this little peptide. A beta is made in this other pathway where first beta secretase acts to cut here, and then gamma secretase to cut here, releasing A beta and a stub called C99 and then a soluble fragment called APS beta. This is unlikely to be the culprit because there's no increase in that in these mice. So we're focused more on which of these guys might mediate a role. Unlikely that the soluble product would play a role. This has never been shown to have a pathogenetic role, at least not by most workers. But these are possibilities. And, and so we've looked to see uh, what goes on. And what we can say is there's a gorgeous correlation, inverse correlation between the amount of these stubs, C83 and C99 versus NGF transport. In every case where we see a decrease in NGF transport, it is true that there's more full-length APP and more stubs. At NGF, we can see that NGF is also present in these early endosomes and these cholinergic axons, so it's in the same place. And in fact, they're larger in the TS65DN mouse, uh, these NGF-containing endosomes. So NGF is in the right place, APP is in the right place, and I won't go into this data, but the receptors are also in the right place, at least as measured in studies on PC12 cells. So we're 
excited about the possibility, but certainly haven't proven that early endosomes are a locus from which the defect arises. We have also to consider the possibility of energy failure uh, because of abnormal mitochondria. Haven't proven that yet, but need to look at that. It's possible that the, micro, that the microtubule cytoskeleton is abnormal. We have to look at that further. And the motors may be abnormal, although we haven't seen any changes in the levels of motors to date. But we are looking at mechanism very carefully. Now, one of the tools that allows us to look effectively at the mechanism is a new culture system, or really a new use of a culture system, in which we can put neurons on one side, separate those neurons with one or two barriers from their distal axon, so here the cell body, here the distal axon, and actually then examine transport in culture. And the breakthrough here is that we can biotinylate NGF. This is NGF, a little cartoon of it. Here's a little biotin molecule, and we can attach this thing called the quantum dot. It's an immensely fluorescently bright particle. In fact, you can watch it under the fluorescence microscope for 20 minutes. It's a, it's a blazing hot signal. And the surprise for us was that we could actually make these complexes and they would still be biologically active. I don't think I have that, but I can tell you that this complex binds very well the normal receptor for NGF and activates it. And in fact, these guys are internalized in distal axons and transport it. So we can actually watch now, in real time, the transport of these NGF molecules. And so, I hope I can get this for you. So here's a little movie. And what you're seeing now are individual NGF molecules. Here's the cell body. And do you see those little guys moving? So those are three axons. And down the axons are moving these bright particles. Each of those represents a quantum dot. And so one can map with enormous precision how they move, when they move, the speed of movement, the characteristics of movement, and map it quite nicely. This is real time, by the way. You can actually see these guys moving fairly briskly. Here's a, this is a, an even higher concentration of NGF. These endosomes would appear to contain more than one quantum dot, but notice how inexorable their movement is. They move, they pause, they move, but they never move back. They always move forward toward the cell body, right over here. So now we can really do some work with assays that allow us to look in some detail at the characteristics of movement. So here's one axon and here are four quantum dots, and you can see quite nicely. They're nicely separated from one another. You can look at one of them, if you will, and over time, you can see it move and pause and move. Here are two quantum dots in one axon, one crossing over the other, so two different microtubules are being used in that axon. You can watch a series of endosomes moving down an axon, one axon over time. So here we're looking at two minutes of recording, and essentially, notice all the endosomes that are moving down that axon the incredibly well-behaved characteristics of movement with the same speed roughly in all the endosomes and with characteristic pausing occurring at places in the axon. We don't know why they're pausing there, but they are pausing there. Could be switching microtubules. We don't know what it is. We have to figure this out. But the point is you can watch movement with enormous precision. You can measure the rate of movement across a whole bunch of axons. And if you break those axons apart, mean breaking them down one by one, you see that there's a very characteristic rate of movement in individual axons. So here a green axon, here the blue axon, and here the red one. This seems to be the biggest axon and the great display of speeds. But it's very, very easy now to be quite precise about the nature of movement. It's also very interesting that you can measure the number of NGF molecules in an endosome. So now we know the stoichiometry of NGF to quantum dot. It's one to one. At physiological concentrations, one can then measure movement. And it turns out, because quantum dots blink and then blink on again, on and off, you can measure the extent to which the signal goes to zero or not. So this signal goes essentially to zero when it blinks off. And when it blinks on, it comes right back up to essentially the same level. It turns out that means that in that endosome, there was one quantum dot. So we've plotted here the number of endosomes that have one or two or three or four quantum dots, and at physiological concentrations, virtually every endosome has only one NGF molecule, which is a huge surprise. 
So one NGF molecule, one molecule of NGF is enough to keep an endosome signaling down a whole axon. It's really a surprise. But what it says now is we can begin to measure in some detail exactly the nature of the signal that's being moved and with some precision detect differences in Down syndrome. Now you could say, how does this thing look when it gets back to the cell body? And the answer is, the NGF is sitting with its receptor called track A. Notice the overlap shown here in the merged in yellow, here higher power. NGF is also continually found with this activated signaling protein called ERK, again seen in yellow. So these are signaling endosomes that we're actually imaging now. And the comp compartment that contains them is the early endosome containing RAP5. So now we have a lot of tools in our hands that we can do new things with and begin really, for example, to measure the intensity of signaling down the axon <coughs> in these different models. Now, this is uh, the first experiment we've done with a DRG neuron, dorsal ganglion neuron from a mouse with Down syndrome. And this is live. It's, it's actually on. I've turned the movie on. And do you notice a difference in the rate of movement compared to the normal? Do you see that? I mean, there's very little movement. And if you measure this across all these many axons, it turns out the rate of movement is less than one-third of normal. And it looks like the number of endosomes in any one axon is about one-third of normal. So the message here is it looks like the net flux of signaling is very likely to be lower in these neurons. Now, you could ask me why did I do this experiment in dorsal ganglion neurons. And the reality is I got lucky. But I also paid attention to the literature that tells me that this mouse and that people with Down syndrome do have a de defect in nociception, in, in pain and sensory perception. So luckily, I was able to use a neuron that was much easier to, met, to, to collect and to culture. And I think what we're seeing is the beginning of a system in which we can detail with great definition exactly what the mechanism is by which APP overexpression poisons transport. At least we hope so. So in this research strategy, I think we've defined a gene, not the only gene, but one of them. And now we want to pursue treatments that reduce the expression of this gene. And how are we going to do that? So here's our proposal for pathogenesis, that there's too much APP gene expression that decreases NGF transport and makes these neurons sick, but doesn't kill them. I say it doesn't kill them, because even if you take an old TS65 DN mouse, if you deliver NGF to the cell bodies effectively, Within two weeks, they're all back, they're all normal sized, and there's no change. They don't die, they just become massively atrophic. And they fail to make these markers that we use to find them. So the other piece of hopefulness here is that even when neurons are quite sick, it may be possible by restoring NGF signaling to make them well. At least we hope so. So the proposal for treatment is simply to knock down APP gene expression hopefully to keep NGF transport normal and hopefully to prevent dysfunction and degeneration of these neurons. Now, is this pie in the sky? I don't think so because, in fact, there are several uh, compounds that have been shown in assays to uh, actively suppress translation of APP mRNA into APP protein. Um, this is work from Jack Rogers and Rudy Tanzi and Deb Lahiri and, and Nigel Gregg. And we've begun experiments now in mice, but also now in culture, to test these compounds to ask, can we, in culture, and then can we, in the mouse, turn down APP protein to normal levels? And how early can we do this? The hope is that we will be able to turn it down, and the hope is that by turning it down, we'll see that we've restored NGF transport, and the hope is that if we've restored NGF transport, we'll now see these neurons are much healthier and behavior much more normal. So it's not pie in the sky. We're not dealing with some fanciful science fiction thing here. Just as we were dealing with the increased inhibition as a problem, I think we're dealing with a very tangible drug target, something that's in hopefully going to be approachable with existing drugs, and hopefully we'll have news in not a very long time that we've actually been successful in the mouse studies. And of course, this is a very powerful uh, motivator for building these clinical operations that allow us to collect cognitive data and begin to think about clinical trials. I'm hoping that what we're doing is going to make clinical trials something 
de rigueur in the next five to ten years. I'm hoping that we'll have ideas that we can bring to the clinic for initial testing in the next five to ten years. The sooner the better. But it's just a different day in Down syndrome. It's not the same old thing about, you know, just trying to, uh, uh, just trying to support the families. That is terribly important. But I'd love to support these families with medicine that helps their children and their young adults and their older adults be more functional cognitively. And I think terribly importantly, wouldn't it be great if we could prevent the late life decline in cognition, which is such a disaster? So synapses are abnormal in mouse models. We're defining the genes and mechanisms responsible. We're going to try to correct defects in the mice, hopefully sooner rather than later. And we think that these studies, which have to be tough, rigorous, hard-minded science, can actually, if properly looked at and motivated properly, uh, guide and hasten the development of new treatments. So thanks very much.